Hello, welcome everyone. Um, glad you could join. Today we have an invited talk for our AI Institute by uh, Dr. Amitava Das. He is a lead scientist uh, at a uh, newly built or recently built rather uh, Vipro AI lab in Bangalore or Bangalore. And um, earlier he has been an assistant professor and associate professor uh, at uh, academic institutions in India. Uh, he has uh, advised three PhDs to completion and is engaged with uh, advising maybe uh, five or so PhDs right now. Uh, and um, uh, he has, the, you know, since eight years, uh, he got his PhD about eight years ago and um, he has been at various places in the um, US, Norway, others for his postdoc and other activities. Now, for us, what is interesting is that um, he works on various aspects of natural language processing uh, and uh, particularly uh, he focuses on the intersection between human language, mind cognition and artificial intelligence. And, um, you know, as uh, all of you are aware, these are some of the areas where we are quite active in. So, um, and we also have a, a joint project uh, with um, that for which he was responsible in getting started. Um, uh, the one uh, where Vipro is leading a consortium with IIT Patna and um, AISC, uh, the Parkiro project. So with all that, uh, I'm going to, and, and uh, yeah, there is an interesting um, workshop that he is also uh, doing at uh, AAAI called Defectify. Uh, it's on multimodal facts, checking and, uh, uh, you know, hate speech uh, detection. Uh, fact checking and hate, hate speech detection. So, with that introduction, I will pass on to uh, Amitava. Thank you, thank you, sir, for the invitation. So, let me get started. I, I can possibly full screen this. So, good morning to all of you, and you know, thank you, Professor Seth, for inviting for this talk. My talk title is "Gregarious Machine and the Evolution of Social Computing." Possibly, you can you know, understand what I'm trying to say today. So the machine which can understand the societal facts and you know understand societal skill and you know it can act like human. I mean that's the that's the notion of the social computing. And today possibly we do not need to inter, you know introduce social computing what it is. There are dedicated forums like CSCW, SNM and so on people have been talking around. So I, I typically work on the area of NLP. I mean, NLP is my core area. I've been working, you know, since last uh, almost 15 years. I have started, I mean, before neural network, you know, dependency parsing, MNTD, transliteration, machine translation. I have almost worked on all possible aspects of natural language processing. Social computing and multimodality have been actively, you know, working on since the last possibly six, seven years. So with this, let me get started. The image you can see here, possibly depict in an abstract way what I'm going to talk today. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful collage of you know, various emotion from you know, multiple faces. And then you know, it is you know, creating the face of Adam of you know, Michelangelo picture. I, I like this picture very much because this resemblance what I'm going to talk today. I'll be talking about several you know, deeper emotion, psychology, sociology, and so on. So with this, let me get started. To understand my talk, let me give an overview. So I have four parts in my talk. In the part one, I'll be you know, introducing a lot of psycho and sociological models. And this kind of terminology might be very new to the audience of computer science. Dark child, empathy, confirmation bias, homophily, et cetera, et cetera. Then in the second part, I'll be talking about how we can build machine learning model, which can look at the language, social network activities, and various other things so that we can predict somebody's personality, values, dark child, empathy, psychology, sociology, and so on. So this two part, then I'll be talking about how such model, you know, could be giving us some kind of explainability towards, you know, people behavior, like, you know, community construct, you know, terrorism, empathy, hate speech, uh, fake news, several things. And then finally, I'll be ending with those kind of applications. So now, why so many things into one place in one talk, I have been giving, you know, talk on this subject possibly last three or four years. So if I choose the first two, uh, it is becoming very you know abstract to you know computer science people. They listen to it all the you know beautiful terminology and then say, okay, fine. What is the use? But if I go directly here, people say, okay, fine. But I don't know what is this. So what I try to do, I try to wrap 
uh, all these things in one talk. Otherwise, people will not be able to get the meaning of it. But it, you know, it's a lot of content actually. So this part three and four, I will be not going into detail of things, you know, which have parameters and etc. But I will be, you know, going to give you some kind of glimpses. You know, what are the things we are actually working. On. So with this, let me get started. Now in my talk also, <clears throat> so there are several <clears throat> angle to it, you know, societal angle, psychology angle. So sometimes there are a lot of criticism and controversies are there as well. So people ask a lot of questions. So what I request to all my audience is if you have those kind of questions, criticism or whatever, you know, discussion related. So wait until end. If you have clarification on extra kind of question, you know, you can stop me anytime. Ask me a question. I'll be very happy to, you know, answer. So now with this, I'm starting with my talk. So my journey started here, sentiment analysis. In my PhD, I, I worked on this. But I always had a question, uh, sentiment and human sentiment cannot be binary. That's fine, given a test, you find out positive, negative, neutral, and then how positive, how negative, but what is the subject that is fantastic, but this is not the sentiment analysis we should be working on. However, that gave me my PhD, but afterwards I started looking at various other things, you know, to, you know, to find out more definition, more in depth, and then my journey goes on from there. So I started looking at psychology. People have been studying psychology to understand, you know, how human beings are constructed, you know, how, how, they, how they behave. So I started looking at personality. Then I started looking at sociology, you know, how people react to the society, how they face society, how they interact with society. So can you get some kind of model or understanding from there and then apply computer science there. So with this, I started looking at personality model. Maybe this is not very new. I, I did not do anything. There are a lot of people have been working on this before me. And I fortunately I worked with Penny Baker, who is known to be one of the very pioneering figure into psychosocial linguistics in UT Austin. So personality model is our big five model or ocean model, people call various name, construct with five dimensions, openness, conscientiousness, extrovert, agreeable, neurotic. Openness, you can possibly understand. Conscientious, typically people who like everything in order. So typically Mr. Perfect and you know, Miss Perfect, like my mother, you know, everything you know, it has to be in order. So conscientiousness is very high. Extrovert, people like to go out and talk. Agreeable, you can understand. Neurotic, typically sentimental people, you know, very high. Now my definition, we can actually go much deeper level, but you can understand possibly if we have to go into that deeper level, we need a lot more data. And I believe nobody did it, you know, but we are trying to get more data for, for the time being with my PhD student training. So that's the personality model. So I, I describe this as a personal level sentiment model. In psychology, it is being told as, you know, uh, uh, stranger personality model, because this trait could be very easily detected you know, if you look at somebody for five or six days, let's say. Now, what we bring into from sociology is the one level further, values and ethics. Although by name set is called values and ethics, but I describe this as a societal sentiment model. What, what is described? So it describes societal sentiment like benevolence, universalism, conformity, security, tradition. So 10 dimensions are there. So to, to give you a very basic example, I don't know how many uh, you know, in my audience, how many years actually, you know, from India, from US, from other countries. So let me try to give you some example. For example, in US, Texan has their own style of, you know, living. But if you go to Dakota, they have their own style. If you go to Florida, they have their own style. And if you're Native American, you know how they, how they behave and etc. Also in India, you know, Bengalis has their own culture and so on. So can we identify this by machine learning and computer science model? So that's this model actually talking about. So Swartz is a sociologist who described this model in 2000. Again, did some further edit in 2014. So this is the model we pick up from sociology. Again, in this model, we can go in much more deeper level, but unfortunately we do not have that much data as of now, but we'd like to explore in future. Now, Swartz also described all this model from very negative to very positive power, achievement, stimulation from benevolence to universalism. So these are very positive, positive and these are very negative. Also, this could be, this 10 dimension could be grouped into four super classes. These are more social focus, these are more personal focus. So these are conservative people, these are self-transcendent people, these are openness to change and self-advancement. It's okay if you don't understand everything, you know, a lot of jargons and, you know, just, you know, stick with me. I'll, I'll take you through, you know, all the things. So now dark side of personality is another. Another level of personality, which is our dark side, you know, 
we we all have by definition of psychology narcissism machiavellian and psychopathy narcissism possibly understand the egoist people machiavellian typically the manipulative psychopath is little you know uh, they are disordered in many ways also sometime people they, you know describe their track but i don't know with my knowledge i i did not see any work in computational on the sadism maybe there are in recent time i don't know so we stick to the dark track model so i introduced three model basic personality the strange person i'm a stranger personality which could be very you know easily observable societal you know sentiment model like values and ethics and the dark side of it so with this three i'll be constructing a lot more you know uh, complex problem in 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 the future in my talk so now let me start with <clears throat> how we can build this kind of uh, model into you know using computation techniques so let me tell you how the data collection actually happens so there are questionnaire which is typically being you know developed by psychologists i do not have anything to do because i'm not a psychologist so we basically take help from them so we we take the questionnaire however there are a lot of you know controversy there as well which is the good method this question or that question i'm not going to that detail today so what we did we took the questionnaire from the pen and paper group we floated this for the values and ethics model we floated this in amazon mechanical turk and we asked them to you know self report for example it is important to her for reach so somebody has to you know say ki okay sex five or whatever so we got get lot of data however there are a lot of issues you know getting spammers and etc in amazon mechanical turk so we got lot of data and we also asked them to give you know their social media handle name twitter typically so we have their values and ethics numbers or the scores in one hand and their social media you know data in one hand so now our job is to create something which can look at somebody's social media profile and possibly can predict so how the calculation happens so there are a lot of methods so we pick this one so there is a typical uh, this is achievement benefit in the swart values conformity hedonism and so on so based on each direction there are you know questions you know out of 50 questions there are you know defined question there i mean it is not known to the user but known to us then we average them out to get a you know uh, range value minus 1 to 1 we just you know do min max in a normal average so we get minus 1 to 1 now how to construct this problem for computer science or machine learning so there are two ways so typically psychology sociologists prefer to say numbers they say ki amita we were 0.25 open and 0% you know consciousness or whatever so we we took both so we take uh, you know a median score and say ki anything beyond that is yes plus anything under that is no plus and we also take the regression numbers uh, to make classifier so basically for personality we have 10 classifiers values and ethics we have 20 classifiers and then uh, for dark trial we have six classifiers so that's the construct now there are complexity in this kind of problem you know uh, problem construct so the problem is all these dimension are not clearly separable so for example if you look at personality this is this called sarcos you possibly have seen this kind of you know graph before so neurotic the you know sentimental people and the agreeable people I mean, who tend to agree on many things they are not highly correlated but if you look at openness and consciousness people they are highly correlated so what psychology sociology says this says okay you are this much open this much conscience this much extrovert and so on so there are numbers so this is from a very large data set we have collected and we analyzed and we find this this kind of overlaps are there even psychology also agree on this point now similarly values and ethics if you look at traditional people and conformity people conformity people who like to follow rules they have a very high overlap similarly traditional people and uh, sorry look at achievement people you know oriented people and power oriented people i mean they also have a very high overlap in terms of you know their traits so that's obvious so that's why this kind of you know making separate uh, scale and separate class is is a tough problem so what we started with we started with the basic thing what everybody does uh, developed by penebaker luke analysis so we started to understand uh, how you know word usage and you know somebody's personalities and values are actually connected so oh, sorry so what we did is something i can put it up somewhere possibly okay so how 
better. Okay, so if you look at benevolent people, they use a lot of effect related word. I mean, like a sentimental word because they, they think about others. But if you look at power oriented people, they do not use this kind of words. Similarly, self directed people, I mean, who like to live their life by their own rule, they use a lot of exclusive word in a sense, they are very particular about the choices. So, and uh, they also use a lot of negative emotion in, in quite frequently in their, uh, you know, whatever they write in social media or how they, you know, communicate with people. Why? Because, you know, they, they most of the times they, you know, explain to people why they don't like the rule, you know, you know, imposed to them by society and so on. Now, similarly, if you look at, you know, uh, metaphoric and religious word, conformity people use a lot of them. Power oriented people do not use them, maybe in negative uh, correlation. Traditional people, again, use a lot of them. So similarly, I mean, I can, I can go deeper in each dimension and I can talk about it. But what I'm trying to convey here is how unknowingly we use our words. I'm, and this analysis is not over one day. We have collected somebody's profile for last five years or so. So how people are using language, what kind of word usage they're doing, what choices they're using. So we, we are trying to analyze that. Again, Harvard General Enquirer, this is, you know, very common and very popular, uh, you know, thesaurus, people use it uh, several times for several sentiment analysis tasks. It has a lot of classes. Out of those classes, we find these classes are very useful to, you know, our cases, positive, negative, strong versus weak, passive, overstated and understated and so on. So what we did for Luke, we have a 70 dimension. So 70 is a vector sp space for any user. Now we added this dimension, maybe 20 more. So, you know, 90 is a vector dimension. Then we find this data set is very useful. It's called MRC Psycholinguistic data set developed by, you know, Oxford long back in 88. So what it has is familiar. It has a lot of dimension in uh, psychosociological uh, linguistics, familiarity, concreteness, imagery, and age. So let me explain you. So now let me tell you how it actually come uh, to into picture in linguistics. So anagram solving. So if I show you some anagram, you know, very quickly, and if I ask you to solve, how quickly you are able to solve it? That's actually related to your familiarity with that particular word. If it is a very popular word, you will be able to solve it very quickly. If it is not, then it, you might take time. So there are familiarity score attached with every four classes, noun, verb, adjective, adverb. Then concreteness. Concreteness is something, I mean, I mean, you, you possibly have seen people who are never concrete. They say, I might go this time, possibly. They use a lot of those kind of words. So concreteness is being attached with typically modifiers, adjective and, ad, and adverbs. So those quotes are there. Imagery. There are people who use a lot of imagery words. So what is imagery? For example, if I say, you know, just, you know, explain to you, there's a nice and beautiful beach. Possibly to understand that concept, you have to think about it. You have to, you know, visualize, okay, there's a beach and all those things. So this connected to imagery. But if I tell you a number, might be there's no imagery there. Age of acquisition. So how long you know people have been using this? So that is also there in this data set. So how the data set has been created, this is a long story. But these you know, features have you know, become very useful for our case. Sensicon, developed by Carlos Traparga from FBK. And uh, when I said you know, we have been using uh, this data set for this, he was very excited. So what it has is, so see, to you know, understand any concept, we have to use our five senses, right? You know, we can see it, we can touch it, we can hear it, we can test it, we can smell it. Now to experience an apple, what is the distribution of the senses we have to use? How much sight, how much taste, how much smell and so on. So this kind of distribution is there. So there are a lot of, you know, psycholinguistic analysis people did uh, before uh, developing this. What we did is very interesting. We said, okay, Somebody's personalities, values, dark red are connected how they're using their senses. For example, if I look at somebody's profile over the last five years, what are the senses he or she used mostly? Whether it's sight or touch or taste or smell. If it is this, this two, then probably that person is more extrovert. If this, this two, then pro probably those two, you know, those person is more towards introvert. So we started looking at the distribution of, you know, word usage of somebody into this sensicon scale. And that really become very useful for us. Speech act, again, very important. So when we talk, we use several speech act or dialogues, like you no know, opinions, statement, WH question, yes, no question, 
active directives, yes answer, thanks, appreciation, so on. So although this is a, this is a very old task developed by uh, many uh, on uh, Jurovsky back in early 80s or mid 80s possibly, they call switchboard corpus. Uh, they, there are 42 dimensions altogether, or uh, dialogue apps has been defined, but we picked this, you know, 11 because those are more common in social media. So what we did, we tried to understand how people talk. I mean, what kind of speech act they use mostly, whether they are asking question all the time or whether they have opinion for every opinion or they have yes answer, they do enough thanking. And also what's the sequence of their talking and when they put an opinion, when people counter them, whether they put another opinion or they ask question. So what is the bigram, diagram and the sequence of those speech acts also become very useful to understand somebody's personalities and values and how they you know, face society. Although speech act classification, it's not a solved problem. I mean, we, we published paper on this. We are around 70 in a F score. So I'm not saying it's a solved problem, but whatever 70% accuracy we have, uh, it's still usable and we used it uh, for our purpose. Then obviously social network features, that's, that's quite obvious. So total number of tweets, basically activity level, total number of likes. So given versus received. So we found given is more important to understand somebody's personality. I mean, received is fine. If you are you have more followers, you are getting more likes, but whether you are giving enough likes to other, that's a you know very interesting uh, you know observation about somebody's personality. Activity level again, average time difference between two to eight message and so on, in degree, out degree. Betweenness, betweenness is simply, you know, how many close friends are, are there? If I'm a friend with A and A is a friend with B, whether B is a friend of me or not. So overall betweenness of the graph. Reciprocity again, so in a, in a conversation, whether that guy is, you know, reciprocal enough in the communication in the social network. So with this all feature set, we developed uh, machine learning models. Uh, <clears throat> I am not going to the details of the similar uh, feature description for dark drive, because that would be quite similar. You can, you know, if you have interest, you can go to the paper, but rather I would like to go into next step, you know, and you know how we can use this kind of model for what kind of purposes. However, we also use uh, deep learning models and uh, it did not work well for this kind of purpose. And, but whenever I say people, you know, you know, start, you know, firing at me at various conferences and various talks. So no, I'm not a, you know, uh, I'm also a follower or fan of deep learning models, but deep learning models has its own way to use. It, it is not working here because it's not finding out some, you know, position or embedding information. It is to go deeper into the language. So rather uh, support vector machine actually worked well with this, you know, hand curated features. So I, I am not going into the details of feature ablation, which feature works and et cetera. Rather, let me stop here. So what we achieved, this is a paper, you know, uh, now well cited. So we, we got around 80, 81 and 73 for personality, values and ethics and tough trade of personality. This is the accuracy we, we achieved after all the data collection and all this feature ablation and so on. So now, we got excited at this level. Okay, fine. We got this, all the models uh, ready. What you can do using them? Can you use them for some real purpose? But otherwise, these are all theoretical papers. So we started applying them into multiple things. And I, I often refer to this paper. If we look at social media activities and etc., possibly we have this three, you know, key components, actors, content, and network. So we started exploring a lot of dimensions here. So if you look at actors, this is the most, most part I'll be talking today. So we started looking at various things, personality, values, dark type, empathy, optimism, greed. However, I will not be able to talk about everything today, but these are the most of the things I highlighted, I'll be talking. The network, community you know, detection, evolution, hyperpartition, hyperpluralism, botnet, destabilization, several things. If you look at content side, retweeting behavior, demographic behavior, misinformation, disinformation, fake, so all these things. So if we bring all these things together, what we can achieve together. So we started applying, this is the first problem we, we you know, take into hand. So community detection is a, you know, kind of well-established problem in the complex network or whoever work in social media. So what people say, okay, given a graph, I'm trying to identify, you know, communities, basically subgraphs. And what is the definition of subgraph? I mean, nobody knows. And people define by their own choices. But if you look at somebody's social media profile, we have a lot more differences, right? We have family members, we have high school friends, we have friends for several jobs, we have 
so many other people all are not my friend so what you said okay so if we take this problem and try to inject our you know more deeper model to understand somebody's personality values and so on can i get something so what i can get now if you think this is a community there are 10 users here user 1 2 3 and user 10 and if you think these are their values numbers whatever we got from machine learning achievement and benefit and so on now what i'm trying to understand is if this is a community why this is a community i mean if people are together there must be a reason that they're together right so what is the commonality here so what we did is very simple we said okay, okay let us apply you know entropy and try to see how on the which dimension they are they are similar so what we found if you look at achievement they are quite similar that makes sense okay fine so this comment is achievement oriented community so this is a common you know a trait people have that's why they are together and as i said earlier these are fuzzy models so there are maybe maybe secondary or tertiary dimension they're also quite similar so self-direction and stimulation so this is a community majorly achievement oriented then self-direction and stimulation okay fine so with this what we can achieve what we did we took the snap data set which is very well used and uh, developed by you know zure leskovec in stanford university you know this is a well-cited paper and we took the data set this is a triple ai paper in 2017 we took the data set and you know apply our model into that and try to see okay can we explain why the community how the community construct overall so what we find very interesting uh, power orientation people having problem with any group any kind of group i mean they have always higher entropy traditional people similar now if you see there's a clash otherwise you know self-directed people and conformity people having a high clash and that's obvious because you know self-directed people do not follow any rules conformity people follow rules imposed to them by society or in your organization self-enhancement people i mean they you know run by their own you know for their own interest achievement people they want to achieve together with the group with the society with the community they they're in now whatever i i mean i'm, I'm just you know giving some comments we got from a reviewer in some channels then people started saying okay fine fantastic but what is new here so the new is here i mean this is all known to us yes agreed but there, there was no you know empirical paper before we published this Nobody proved this by empirical results, looking at social media and involved in a lot of, you know, this kind of models. Then we applied these models, uh, you know, into the Cessna model, which is again, the state of the art at that time, again, by Julia Leskovec on the same data set. And we showed that our performance is much better, way better than them. Because we now, you know, we are now considering the graph, graph of people, not graph of nodes. We are actually understanding who are those guys, and what they think and what is their orientation in terms of psychology and sociology. So we got really excited. Uh, so then we started, you know, going into much more deeper in dimension. So can we go deeper? Can we understand more? So then we look at the, the second one. Let me, you know, it's a smaller video I have. Vsauce, Kevin here, your Vsauce 2 friend, your college friend, the friend of a friend you met at a party, a family reunion, a concert, an online forum dedicated to Japanese role-playing games. But am I really your friend? Probably not. Why? Because we don't like the same music or movies? Because you wouldn't invite me to your wedding? No because your brain is full. While studying primate social systems, psychologist Robin Dunbar found a correlation between the size of the neocortex and the size of the average social group. The larger the neocortex, the larger the group size. By extrapolating his findings and applying them to humans, he arrived at a cognitive limit for the amount of complex, mutually affectionate social relationships a person's brain can handle. A research guideline for the number of real friends you can have. A literal friend zone of 150. Dunbar's number. So who are all these Facebook friends I'm not actually friends with okay so we got really excited by the dumbest number and this is a quite famous in uh, you know who actually work on social computing and so on so we started going deeper so we collected a lot of data this is one of the work by one of my master students sudesh 
So we ask people, okay, there are a lot of people, their followers and following, you are following back. So can you tell me what is the relation? Colleagues, relative friends, and so on. Then we started understanding, okay, what's the relation, you know, of personalities and values, you know, with them. So if there is a friend, what kind of friend is? So we, we got a lot more details here. Again, uh, you know, to save time, I'm not going into details. So in not a top level, I would like to say, you know, there are a lot of personality match in terms of, you know, when you look at friends, but there are a lot of values and ethics match when you look at relatives. And that's really interesting. Then we publish again. Then we started looking at the bigger scale. Okay, can you look at now big scale? Can you look at India versus US, you know, two, two different cultures and what we can infer there. Now, if you remember at the very beginning, I described the Swatch model, I said, those could be categorized into four, you know, bigger groups, self-enhancement, conservation, transcendence, and so on and so forth. So if you know India, if you are from India, uh, then possibly you can understand this. So what we got very interesting. So we collected a lot of data from all these 20 cities and each city has around 5,000 and more users. And we, we started analyzing the kind of, you know, the sentiment or the values of that particular city. What we got, Benares is the most conservative place. Again, don't take me wrong. This is the analysis we got. Whether this is actually in the society or not, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about that later. So what we got, this is the most conservative place. Even, you know, somehow this place, you know, the North and East, not this Northeast, this North and East is a reasonably, you know, conservative place in India. And if you look at the you know, West side, people are more, you know, self enhanced and oriented. That's obvious because this is the kind of business hub, um, Mumbai or, you know, Ahmedabad or Pune or so on. So that's, you know, excite us. Okay, so now can we apply this to US? So we applied that to US and it's around 200K and uh, no, 200,000 uh, users data from US we have collected. And if you look at with the color, power achievement and benevolence and so on, what do you got if you look at any big cities, you know, in, in US uh, starting from, you know, Oregon, uh, you know, San Francisco to Illinois to, you know, Chicago, Florida, Dallas. So all big cities, you know, majorly, you know, filled up with people like this. Again, don't take me wrong. I'm not saying there is no, you know, universalism or benevolent people living there. No, that's not the idea. The majority is that. And, but if you go to, you know, deeper into the country, or Dakota, Nevada, or, you know, deeper in Texas or something, you get people, you know, who are more, you know, concerned about the neighborhood. I mean, that's possibly obvious for any society, right? So whenever we want to achieve something big, we, we move to cities and do something big there. So that's the way in you know, a community forms. So that again, excites us and we publish again. So now uh, we started analyzing more deeper. So can you understand somebody's, you know, positivity, optimism and pessimism based on, you know, what their personality is and where they belong to. So I, I typically give this example to my student all the time it's to, to typically Srini, if I send you to Namibia without any phone connection or internet, uh, you possibly not remain you know, positive about life. Why? Because positivity and negativity depends on our personality and the group we are in. So we took the data from RADA, uh, University of Michigan, earlier she was in University of North Texas when I was in US. So they developed a very large data set about you know, optimism and pessimism. So if you look at this statement, prettiest phone ever, I love it. It's a positive statement, but not optimist possibly. But if you look at here, be positive, think positive, like positive, and et cetera, it's an it's a optimist statement. Again, this is a bad time for me. It's a you know, kind of negative statement, but this is more pessimistic. So how, how things being defined by Rata is, you know, if you look at somebody's whole uh, post, all the posts and try to, you know, define the optimism, pessimism, you, you got a spectrum. And you say your yeah, top guys are you know, optimists and bottom guys are pessimists and so on. So what we did, we tried to analyze, okay, what makes people optimist and pessimist when they're in a group? So what we saw, it's very interesting. Uh, this one, I, I really like it. So if you look at agreeable guy, I'm quite sure every friend group, there is the agreeable guy. And you know, if you want to go party, yes, he said, yes. You don't go to lab today, yes. So he's an agreeable guy, so always agree. So he or she has never problem. So this is the personality. And these are the values of the group they are into. Benevolent, conformity, hedonism, power, and so on. So see, their optimism level is mostly positive wherever they are, because they never counter, except the traditional group. But if you look at the conscientious guy who is you know, more uh, uh, to the point or organized, that guy has problem in the power orientation group, in the traditional group, in the you know, self-directed group, 
and this number also defined many things. So that's very interesting. So again, we publish. So this is something uh, we got, uh, it, it is still unpublished. So, so we have been working. So this is something on the community evaluation. So we are trying to, and we are actually able to explain how the community evolution happened in, a, in, in Twitter network. So when people start following somebody, unfollow somebody, it depends on the you know kind of optimism, pessimism is there. If people think if I you know start following this guy, I get a lot of positive vibe and so on. So we, we are able to explain it to certain level. And on the top of the you know uh, uh, permanence model, which is developed by uh, Tanma in his PhD, this is completely topological. Now, this is one project uh, we have been running from the last two and a half years. I named it Helios. So we have been discussing and debating on the deeper things into, into this project. This is a collaboration with IIT Patna, Triple IIT Delhi, and University of Texas, Austin. So this is the kind of group. Uh, Math from UT Austin, Asi from IIT Patna, Tanmoy, and a lot of students. Now the application side of it. So possibly analysis is over. I have around 20 minutes or so. So now a real applications into you know social networking or you know social computing. So now the question is, uh, if you look at the hot topics today, you know hate speech, fake news, and it is a real problem in society. Not only computational problem, it's a real problem. So we got motivated from this paper, which published uh, in 2009. They said hate speech actually connected with somebody's you know dark side. So they have shown uh, with the 60,000 users data from social media that who actually troll publicly, they have certain kind of dark side orientation. And whenever I said this, you know, you know, computer science people again, you know, uh, you know, start firing at me. So what psychology says, we all have dark side orientation, maybe, maybe, you know, smaller in scale, uh, but we have it. And but who have higher degree, you know, Machiavellian, who are more, you know, manipulative, who have more egoism, narcissism, and so on. So they are in a bad scale, but the question is who start all this hate speech in social network? What is the origin of it? I mean, yes, I mean, sometimes we also share, we comment to that and whenever we comment, it's, it's got, you know, circulated and so on, but who starts? So can you get the origin of it? Again, I will not go into the hate speech classifier. Maybe you have seen such classifiers several times. Aggression, again, I'm not going to deeper of the, you know, it's a capsule network, I'm not going deeper into that. But aggression define what is the degree of the head, you know, whether it's a overtly aggressive or covertly aggressive. So what is the degree of the head? So what we did, we collect a lot of head speech data and their spread. What is spread? If you look at social network, let's say I post something, it is visible to my first of network. If they comment, reshare or whatever, it is visible to their first of network. So this is the way information got diffused. So we collected the whole branch and whole trade, how head speech actually is flooded because that has another application. So what we got very interesting, we found around 70% people I mean, who start the head speech have certain kind of dark side orientation. So what does it mean? So for example, the data we have collected is around 60% is sexism and 40% is racism. And if you look at again in the sexism as covertly aggressive and overtly aggressive, there is a you know very good bias towards the data. Psychopath use it more than 50% time. Narcissist use in you know the overtly aggressive 50% time, and so on. So we are we are getting a very you know prominent you know pattern here, which is uh, the head speech actually gets started by this kind of people most of the times. Then what happened in social network? Sometimes the origin got lost. That, that guy deleted or whatever it's got deleted, but it remained in the social network. Whereas, you know, actually it has been added uh, after the reviewer's comment. Uh, I mean, people always have criticism towards this kind of research. A correlation is not position. So we shown again, the people we choose, uh, you know, randomly a uh, lot of people and who don't have much uh, orientation towards that tribe. And then we shown key, there is no such pattern, you know, appearing. We took three data set randomly and, and shown it. So what we got is a nice pattern uh, dark child and you know head speech. So if you look at this uh, this axis X and Z, so this is basically the scale of uh, head. And if you go by Y here, so it, it, this is the actually the uh, dark child orientation, narcissism, racist versus Machiavellian, racist versus psychopath, and sexist versus Machiavellian, and so on. So you can see there's a peak everywhere. So whenever it goes high, 
there's a high chance that the, the head pitch will be started from there. Now, what is the use of it? Now, let me talk about the use of it. So, this is the topic my you know students started working training my PhD student I call it diffuse project again so can we uh, speculate or can we anticipate the, the way it will be you know diffuse in social network whenever we have some kind of information so what is diffusion very you know if you don't understand so very quickly so if you can see this is an origin of information here here and here and you see this is a very you know tiny spread it has gone to but it has gone to several people. So now, can we assess the vulnerability of this post? But how many people it is reaching out to? And this is in nutshell we are trying to understand how far it will go, how fast it will go, through which path it will be crossing, which path, and when it is crossing path, what the people, influentiality, source, and all the hops. So that's the you know diffuse social definition to us. It is little different than typical uh, you know. Uh, social network people do they they call cascade they only find out how many uh, layers actually reach out to but we actually predict the actual path so we started you know applying all this model into you know here's this, you know diffusion prediction so what we bring into i'm just jumping this we bring into a behavior embedding model so we we just plugged in you know personality uh, values and ethics and dark track and what we got again we published uh, this paper we got a nice, you know, very nice actually. Uh, so this is uh, probably people are here, you know, set of the art, this is the last year one. And we got this much accuracy in terms of uh, predicting the diffusion. Again, we are predicting all the nodes, not only the cascade. So it's much more complex problem than the normal cascade paper people typically, you know, write. So now then again, we bring another model because see, if you look at societal problems, it has many more layers. I mean, only bringing one model may not solve all the problem, personality values, societal factors, time, political issues, news media, external forces, neighboring countries, a lot of issues are there. So one more issue we just bring in, empathy. So this is, we have been discussing with University of Pennsylvania, Lyle, and we have been actively you know, talking and collaborating on this. So empathy defined by how we are reciprocal towards something happening around us. So that's the empathy. So we again collected data, again, the same method, psychology, the psycho, you know, questionnaire, plotted, got a lot of data over Twitter and so on. Build classifier, again, forget about that. Something very similar. Maybe the network, you know, Srini is trying with new networks every time. So, so this is something he, he developed. So, this time we we started looking at again two different perspectives not only personality values but can we understand you know age and gender as well again age and gender if if you look at social media is not always trustful because people what people write uh, you know king of my own kingdom or ceo of my own company and blah blah does not make sense so we have again you know defined classifier and etc that's again another task there are a lot of chapters happen on that so we have very good accuracy in the, you know uh, classifiers for age and gender what we got again after a lot of analysis is very interesting so these are the people you know around the age 20 30 they are very high empathy empathetic towards hair speech so we got a nice pattern here again male user are you know uh, show high empathy towards hair speech you know don't take me wrong i mean i'm not saying anything against any gender this is what we got from our analysis Again, with this, whenever we embed that extra empathy towards uh, the model, we get in a, from, from a 83 uh, or 80 to 85. Again, is a, is a big jump. So we got again excited. So, you know, so although we started all this journey very naively, but then we started, you know, applying and we started getting a lot of good results and we got, uh, you know, started going more deeper. Now about fake news, we, everybody know what is, what is fake news. So these are a lot of example from the you know workshop uh, Professor Shep just mentioned for Triple AI. We are releasing 50k data on the multimodal you know fact verification. So again, we we applied that uh, on the fake news uh, diffusion as well. So again, we got wonderful results on the three data set, uh, which are very commonly used in textual uh, you know uh, fact verification, quality fact, gossip cop, and you know quality fact. Uh, no, this is something. This two, sorry. Is standard deviation. So again, we we you know our model crossed the SOTA and reasonably. 
So then with all these things within the <coughs> Helios project, we developed a simulator. So let me just show you a glimpse of that simulator. Hello everyone. Today, I'll present to you a visualization tool for information spread on social media. With an increase in usage of online platforms, Maybe there has be been an exponential rise in online researchers are working on how to analyze and predict the spread as early as possible. Using the proposed tool, they can... Okay, so this is Sarah's voice, so I'm not going into the whole data. It's a longer video he record, she recorded. So what we do here is we just, you know, uh, plug in all those models and try to see how the diffusion is getting predicted and how the actual, you know, diffusion happened. And then we try to analyze point-wise what is the problem and, you know, see how, how we can improve. That's a nice tool we developed uh, during the Helios project. So these are the few things uh, um, we are currently working on. So hyperpluralism, I mean, this is a nice concept. I, I don't know whether you have heard about it. But let me just, you know, I just take the opportunity to interact with the audience here. I'm, you know, I'm trying to give you one, you know, scenario. Let's say you, you just walk into Walmart and you see there are 10 guys standing at some position and they're looking at, you know, up and trying to see something and with curiosity. Whether you will stop by and look at, look at up. Just give me yes or no. Sorry, I didn't quite catch the question. Yeah, the question is, let's say I'm going into the Walmart and I see there are 10 guys standing there and trying to look something curiously at the up. Hmm. So whether I'll stop by and look at up. Uh, uh, I would think uh, mo many people do because if you look at uh, uh, accident on the road, uh, everybody slows down on the other lane, uh, opposite lane, just to, you know, it's called rubber necking, just to, you know, see what's happening there. So. A lot of people, uh, you know, are curious and, or, or I don't know, yeah, at least sufficient number of people uh, that uh, the whole uh, opposite lane also slows down a lot when there's a car, you know, car accident, let's say. So the curiosity is pretty high. In, in fact, it's very interesting. Manas is currently working on information curiosity uh, issue with PK. Uh, oh. But is that what you are? Uh, is the curiosity an issue? Is that a question you, you have or is something else? No, okay, no, no, no. Hyper pluralism actually, you know, developed, you know, the concept developed from sociology, but it has been used in a reverse way by Harvard Business School in early 80s. So they did experiment one nice thing in the, you know, in that time, in a busy New York state in an office time, they just put 10 guys who are, you know, kind of curiously looking at up and the whole traffic stops. So it's actually, you know, create, you know, the, if, if, if you look at the Cambridge Analytica case, so people actually do social reverse social engineering to create this you know snowball effect so if i go at social media and start seeing everybody is you know talking happily about trump i may start start believing it so that's the you know uh, kind of uh, phenomena uh, you know created so we are, we are you know we have collected a lot of data and we are trying to analyze that and whether we can you know detect that early so that's uh, that's one interesting aspect uh, we have been working on oh, yeah. six minutes. Confirmation bias, again, uh, very quickly, what is confirmation bias? Again, so I just give the Trump example, don't take me long. So, you know, if everybody starts saying he Trump is a very nice person, you know, I might think twice, okay, it's recent. So actually we believe whatever we want to believe. So we have orientation. So can we detect confirmation bias in social network? By looking at their, you know, what they're, you know, sharing and so on. So we analyze a lot of things, and again, just you know, so you just talk about PK. So I, I'll be just talking about one work with PK. Again, hyperpartition up in uh, social media and typical news channels. We have uh, identified a lot of data in India. Typically, they are right wing or left wing uh, orientation. Teleportation probability. We, you know, started working on. And uh, this is uh, something uh, we just thought of, but we did just the first task and then we didn't get time. So what is the idea? So whenever, you know, uh, all these forums, CSCW, SNM and whatever people, the, the common question being asked to any you know, social computing researcher is, what is the guarantee or what is the probability that the social network is a right proxy to the society? So we started thinking, can we find out some kind of relation? So, 
in, in terms of many things, gender issue, age distribution, literacy rate, crime rate, and so on. So what we did, we find a nice correlation of India's crime and the values graph. And uh, you know, I, I typically quote this because the criminals does not come uh, from space, actually they are born and brought up in the society. So to, very quickly, uh, where the traditionalism is high, the crime against women and childs are very, very high in India. Whereas this side is not that high. There are different kinds of crime, you know, property crimes and et cetera may be higher, but in the traditionalism, those kinds of things are very high. Then uh, there are actually, we, we published quite a few papers in this. This is something also PK was involved at that time. So we collected a significant amount of data of ISIS, uh, you know, official accounts and their followers and a lot of networks, how they recruit and so on. So what we did is we tried to answer two things. Who are more vulnerable towards ISIS recruitment? And uh, what is their you know, cycle and sociological you know, factors? How, how they behave in social network? Because uh, ISIS doesn't come to me to recruit me. So there are certain things. So this is a paper in SNM we published. SNM, yeah, possibly SNM in 2017 or 18. So we have shown that there's a nice you know, distribution and these spikes are very, very different than the normal crowd. They are you know, conformity, following rules, their hedonism, and their you know, high sentimentalism, their pessimism, age, you know, age gender distribution, male, female, and so on, are really, you know, we can detect it and uh, we can possibly you know, mark as rape. Key. These are possible you know, uh, guys who could be recruited or baptized by any uh, extreme organization. So uh, at the end, let me thank all of my students actually who, who worked on this. And these are typical my collaborators on this front, whatever I, you know, I've been talking, I have somehow collaborated with them. Who, what, so did you work, what did you work with, uh, you know, what did you do with Lyle? Lyle, okay, empathy. So empathy model, how empathy model, you know, could be, you know, describe more and we can you know uh, do a lot more things into uh, whatever we are doing head speech propagation and so on so he's been, he's been very very interested into that yeah, right. a very very interesting uh, set of uh, collaborators and you know kind of fits a very unique uh, i guess uh, uh, network um I, and I, I, I at some high level even though i don't know all of them very well uh, i know eric um I know of Lyle, but don't know him personally. Uh, of course, I know PK and uh, Tanmay. Uh, Radha, I know of uh, for a long time. Um, haven't come across boy John, uh, but good. Yeah, very really interesting set of thing and and you know, set of collaborators. Thanks, Professor. So let me just quickly conclude, and uh, what I always said: the so gregarious machine. I mean, the the machine who can understand society. So I, I typically end with this quote of Minsky. He, he said in his, you know, the seminal book, you know, the question is, uh, you know, the machine needs emotion to be, you know, to call intelligent. So possibly we come across long way after that. And, you know, today uh, the basic emotion, basic sentiment is probably a solved problem. So now it's time to go further and probably our, you know, in the new era, the machine should understand the social skill if it has to really make a, you know, position in the society. So with this, I rest open for question, discussion, anything. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, there's a small question uh, Tilini has. Uh, maybe there are others who might have questions. Yes. She says, do you take an account or try to eliminate any self-reported bias in the participants, the, the participants might have? Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I mean, this is, Actually, it's a common question. Okay, so I I work I have been working with psychologists since long time, just since my PhD. So see, they never you know make consensus on anything. So self-reporting whether it's a right way or wrong way, even there are a lot of you know disagreement among psychologists. So what is the other way? So the other way is you know you can go to my friends and you know people who know me better, and you can take you know kind of you know, survey from them. That method also exists, and people tried that and published that results and so on. But 
to making that happen to large scale data set is very difficult. So we might get few hundred data set in that way. We cannot make this kind of model, computational model, which is data hungry. So yes, self-reporting may be biased towards. And also in, in uh, when we go, go to, you know, uh, crowdsourcing services, there are a lot of spammers who click all the first links and all those things. So we have uh, methods to, you know, kind of detect that. We again give question to them in a different ways and et cetera. So all those filtering we did. Good. Um, guys, uh, anybody else uh, has question? We have, uh, there is, there is, Manas is gone. Okay. Um, we had, um, I know, we've been long working with a uh, psychologist, uh, Valerie Shalin. So that way we had, um, a good access to you know expertise in psycholinguistics and other things and the access to literature in cognitive science which is very broad and deep and um we had somebody to really uh, bring those things to us um we did work on harassment on social media we had a good size project from national science foundation uh, there are uh, projects uh, we just had one project funded on misinformation uh, decision making in the presence of misinformation with applications to public health and uh, disaster coordination. Um, and um, I think that uh, we had, you know, I had a PhD student who now is a faculty at Georgia State. Um, he worked on radicalization and uh, toxic, toxic content. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, persuasion on social media and things of that nature um i i i, I think things that um we've been interested in we've done some work uh, a little bit but um this would be a very uh refreshing set of uh you know and this will be more refreshing approach I, i'm glad you had so much uh um what you know collaborations with psychologists um we just submitted a grant application that has sociologists and community scientists and network science researcher and network computing researcher and forensics, computing forensics researcher. Um, great. Um, guys, anybody has any question? Well, in that case, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this talk. Uh, thank you very much, Amitava. Uh, it uh, also helps me keep track on all the you know topics that you are interested in which is interest you know and um i hope to be you know having more and more conversations as we go along okay thank you very much and uh, i'll okay. officially uh, you know close the talk